Let me, let me take the wingspan of this specimen in a way that doesn't block the light. How many centimeters is this? About 30, 40, yeah, at least. It's about 40 centimeter wingspan. So for Samia, if we put them to the side, we see like the, the difference. Sorry for <laughs> awkwardly. Yeah, yeah, no problem. But if, yes, if you look at like this, see, wow, it's like double the size. It's like a small atlas moth, almost. Yes, it I looks mean, like a small atlas moth, also. The, 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 they are, if you way. think about it. They are very close or late, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Perfect. Wow! Giant Samia ricini. Here you are looking at two specimens of the Eri silk moth. A normal sized specimen versus a giant specimen. Believe it or not, but these giant Samia moths were raised by one of my friends, a PhD entomologist by the name of Enzo Moretto, who I had the pleasure of working with on a special project in which I will reveal more information on another future video. But today we are focusing on these giant Samia ricini. What makes them so big, so much more big than the regular Samia ricini? Let's interview a specialist, the person who has raised them himself. Hello everyone, this is Bart Coppens and today I'm going to show you something interesting. We have been involved in a filming project in which I will reveal more details later because today we are not going to talk about the filming project, but about the moths that we are using for filming. Me and another entomologist from Italy Dr. Enzo Moretto today um, have also been involved in this project because we were expected to bring some of these moths to the set. Now, most of you will probably recognize this species. It is uh, the Eri silk moth, the Samia ricini, and uh, if you're familiar with these, you've probably seen them on my channel already. But what I found very interesting is uh, Dr. Enzo Moretto here has raised a few specimens with a pretty exceptional wingspan of up to 40 centimeters. Now, of course, the size of these individuals, they, they vary per individual moth. But despite that, I've raised a lot of them, big ones, small ones, but never this big. So I thought it was interesting because obviously this guy knows something that I don't know. So I was just wondering if I could ask him some questions about how he worked his magic to get a specimen this big. I'll show the close-up later, so don't worry about that. But maybe you can tell about what you did to... Well, for, the, for this special project, we decided to have a hex from different stocks. Mm -hmm. And I uh, got a stock from, uh, from, from friends, it's been pupae, but most of them were, were raised next to us. So I did raise them next to our museum, that's in Zappolis. Also, we have a butterfly exhibition. We did some work there, but mostly in our farm. And we have a butterfly farm, uh, well, we, we just uh, uh, breed butterfly and some moth too. And I use normal ligustrum, so that's a ligustrum japonicum with large leaf. Uh, but uh, what happened with this moth? Uh, maybe I have to reconstruct the story. Uh, the other stock grow regularly, mm -hmm. but this one yes, got broken. That's, that's maybe uh, what happened. And we tried to sustain it a bit because we lost a lot of caterpillar, it was too dry at the beginning. So a few sele were selected, very strong. Yeah. And then they grow up, uh, we give uh, a lot of care to them. We give maybe more food, more humidity later. They start to grow very much. I noted there were some caterpillar very big, very few. And I didn't expect it, but such a big large moths come out. So this was a surprise for me. Yeah. But one thing that you guys don't know, is uh, that uh, Mr. Enzo here for this movie? How many did you raise? I think it was seven, six hundred? Seven hundred. Seven hundred Sami Aricini. So that was a, a hell of a job, really. So um, I'm wondering, what did you do to successfully raise such a high number? Well, I just I got the help of my collaborator, of course. I didn't do it myself. I'm a director of the museum, and I spent a lot of time you know, on this project, too. Mm -hmm. But I have people that were checking every day, of course, and put in plant uh, and checking humidity. And, uh, and we have a thermostatic uh, cardboard and so on to control temperature. So that was uh, the key. Okay. So you think it was just a combination of factors? And maybe this one? It just happened to be one of the biggest? Well, maybe, maybe as a, for sure we give a lot of love to them, so that's why they become big. See? It's a really big and fat one. There you go. 
Okay, I think, uh, let me think if there are thermals, thermals in general. Okay, so um, when it comes to the uh, size, the wingspan of the imago, what do you think are the most important factors that, of course there's multiple factors such as food quality, and genetics, genetics but what do you think is the, the biggest limiting factor? Because I see many people online, they try to raise this moth, uh, some of them, they become pathetically small and people blame, blame uh, other breeders to say, oh, it's inbreeding, but maybe people are making a mistake or what, what do you think the limiting factor is? Well, limited factor is the temperature maybe is very impacted. The on temperature? The temperature on the size of the, the, the animal and the quantity of food and the quality of food. So do you recommend a higher or lower uh, temperature? Well, we, we used to breed this at 27 degrees, not very low, but they could breed very well. Also. These are 27 degrees yes, now? Yes, yes. Okay. 27 and uh, between 26, 27, sometimes 28, but uh, normally people can keep them at 20, 21, 22, they go well okay. anyway, but the metabolic rate is lower. Okay. Because uh, I, I once I read a study about the body size of insects, and it showed that some, when you put the insect cold, the metabolism goes very slow, for example with fruit flies, but because of that at cold, <laughs> colder temperatures, sometimes they also produce bigger body size at colder temperature, well, because, yeah, because at a warm uh, temperature they metabolism go too fast and they pupate prematurely. Yeah, that, there's a, there's a well-studied uh, phenomenon, this is a meta about metabolism, so that every time you rise the temperature about 5 degrees or more, or more mm -hmm. that's 10 degrees, every 5 degrees you can double the, the, the speed of the growth and so the, the efficiency of the, of the body. But of course you can work in the range of temperature, you can go over a lower yeah this range, otherwise you, you have a problem yeah. with the species. And I recommend very much hydration and humidity. Hydration? That's the key, but when you have a high temperature, yes, the hydration is very important. Hydration, I think, is always uh, underrated by breeders, because people always think about the food that makes them bigger, yeah. but water also increases the yes. size of the animals. Yes, as it, it, you have to take into account also the type of room that you use, the space, because when you hydrate a lot, maybe most of the humidity goes on the wall of the room, because they are colder, and, uh, and so that the humidity is catched by the wall, you have to take into account this, so you have to go there, you have to good environment that keep a high humidity mm -hmm. and that not, is not catched by the wall. Okay. Last but not least, Dr. Enzo is a very well-known lepidopterist from uh, Italy. Uh, should I call you lepidopterist or just... Yes, an I'm entomologist. Entomologist, entomologist. yes. Okay. And uh, now what I am wondering is, uh, is, is this hobby popular in Italy? Because when I look online and I see the suppliers of the Samia Ricini, I know a few Italian websites who sell them. And it's interesting that the uh, first time I'm working on a filming project like this, I meet the uh, entomologist from Italy. Of course, it also has to do with the background of the other artists. But I do think Italy is uh, like in the Saturnian age, it's, it's big, or am I wrong? Yeah, so you're, you're, you're correct. There's not so many people, but there are good good breeders, of course. But uh, you have to take into account of them. I'm not uh, really Italian because uh, I'm an international uh, exhibitor. Uh, I was one of the first to realize the butterfly exhibition in the world. So I'm in contact with everybody in the planets. Mm -hmm. I was a, among one, those one that did uh, begin the butterfly farming around the world. So uh, we, we, I did a lot in Italy, but uh, we, we just we have a lot of contact around the world. So we can get butterfly pupae from everywhere mm -hmm. in the world. So, but we have also our farm. So uh, this is a project that uh, is uh, mainly uh, dealing with species that we can breed on artificial diet. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why we take very, very much care of the type of food. Yes. And uh, when it comes to the big wingspan, for example, have you ever uh, raised, for example, stuff like the Atlas moth and try to get them to the full size? No, because it's not uh, my aim to have a large insect, if, if I know this, because I did this also with beetles, other insects, everybody likes to have your, a It's big not your goal to make them as big as No, I, of course, I like this because I'm entomologist, I have a passion, I, I made a stack beetle very big, or uh, big dynastas, very big. Uh, yeah, bigger is better. I saw Japanese to, to rise, I did also, uh, I, I breed also Goliathus, other very, very big beetles, not only butterfly moths. Mm -hmm. But the big is better, but sometimes it's just big only. And, but it's interesting from a scientific point of view because they demonstrate the limit of this animal, but they're not the best performer. Yes. <laughs>
Also small as I said, as a meaning the nature. No stack beetle. Yes, it's of very course. Nice. It's a survival strategy. Big, big mandible or small mandible, but every one is a meaning in the nature. So maybe this is the, the this, this happened with few specimen, but not all. I think that's a very, very good point, and I never thought about that because many breeders are always obsessed about having. Oh, I raised the biggest atlas mole. I raised the biggest uh, whatever, right? the biggest samia. Of course, it looked impressive. But it's true that bigger is not always better, because when you look at the biology of any animal, uh, they are usually they are selected for an optimum size, and the optimum is not yeah. always the biggest. If you want to become big, like you said, you have to solve a lot of problems. So why that's why insects cannot be big like us. So uh, they, 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 they cannot become bigger, bigger, and bigger if that doesn't change the concentration of oxygen or the temperature or the humidity. So they need a lot. Of, they require a lot more than us. So they are, they are cold blood. So they have to change respiration. The way the way to transport the emily inside has to complicate for the insect to become big. Okay, I think that sums it up. I want to show you this today. But on my channel, I also do a, a full interview with uh, Dr. Enzo Moreto uh, later. Thank you for your time. Welcome. And uh, thanks everybody for watching. Bye bye.